So let's do this. Uh, let's turn over to First uh, Thessalonians chapter number four, please. And we're going to begin a, I call it a study. But as you'll see, as I'm going to mention, uh, it's probably more of an adventure than a study. But we're going to give it a go. Now, what I'm going to read is uh, verses 13 through 17. Or I guess I can go all the way to 18. And uh, it says in verse 13, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Uh, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. Now, just to give you a little introduction here to First Thessalonians, um, many people ha have spoken to me about this. Say, Brother Dan, when we're going to study this? When are we going to know the end of it? And uh, to do justice to this and to this study, it's going to take time because it has been over the years convoluted by the Christian church and exactly what, what's going to happen here. Okay. Now let me give you a little biography of, of where I'm getting some of my information beside, you know, beside the Bible. Uh, the book by Don uh, uh, Preston called, we shall meet him in the air. The wedding of the King is the name of the book. And uh, this is a very interesting book, and most of the information I got tonight comes from that book. But here's what I find fascinating. Uh, he has an index in the back, and the index is 31 pages, right? The book's about 400-plus uh, pages. And uh, in, those, in that index, he references over 350 books and articles, all right, uh, by different people. To, to show forth what he's trying to bring about. Uh, another book is The Spirit of Prophecy by uh, Max King, and some of you have that book. Another one is The Cross and the Perusi of Christ by Max King. Uh, now that book, the bibliography there, he quotes over 53 authors uh, from 130 books and articles in, in, in that book. Then we have the Perusia, the 1887 edition by a gentleman named James Stuart Russell, okay, which is very, that's the first book I ever read concerning preterism. And then there is a gentleman named John Noe, who I don't hold <laughs> with too much, uh, but he has a book out called Unraveling the End. And the reason I added him to this, because he has, has an article in that book, uh, Seven Reasons your end time view is so important. And I'm gonna bring that forth to us here before we're done. It, it, it is very important that, that we see that. So when we come to the introduction then of, of uh, First Thessalonians chapter four, just a little history on preterism. I was talking with one of our, uh, our saints here a couple weeks ago. They mentioned that they uh, looked up preterism on the internet, which is good went to Google, it, it came up, and when you go to uh, uh, Wikipedia, there's a little article, well, it's a pretty good sized article, but it, it shows that uh, a Jesuit priest named Louis D. Alcarsa, who lived in 1554 to 1613, wrote the first systematic preterist exposition of prophecy. Now, let me help you with something. All right, with this. He is not the one that invented it. He wrote the first systematic 
preterist exposition of prophecy. In other words, what he did, uh, he took the information that he found and he put it all together. All right. I have a number of uh, systematic theology books in my library and none of those books, okay, uh, uh, like Charles Schaefer, who uh, was one of the founders of Dallas Theological Seminary, he, he doesn't say, hey, I founded all this. No, he brings brings forth information from people from before him. So it's interesting uh, that you look at that, but uh, uh, Lewis, his work was published in 1614, which was a year after his death that folks published it, all right? And the reason they published it was to counter the Reformation, thought that, that the Reformation folks were going too far. And I have a number of books uh, uh, of people that thought that from back in those days. Now, there were other people that believed and wrote concerning preterism. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, uh, 194 AD, uh, a gentleman named Hanathius, oh, he, he lived in the fourth century, uh, Eusebius from the fourth century, and then Origen also wrote about it. Now, a lot of you know who, who Origen was. He believed in universal reconciliation, um, but uh, Dennis Coyle told me this from his studies, that his whole library was burned by the Muslims when the, uh, 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 when the Moors uh, invaded Egypt, okay, and I don't remember the uh, the exact date there that that happened, but his uh, his library and, and and it was well over a couple of hundred volumes. All right, at that time, um, was destroyed at that time. So that's a little history. Now, because we came out of, and I'm not saying you have come out of it, but I came out of dispensationalism. I dispensationalists uh, from the time I was uh, uh, saved. You know, uh, Schofield dispensationalism went mid. <laughs> Acts 13, 28, that, that sort of thing. Now, classic dispensationalism began with John Nelson Darby is the gentleman's name. Okay. He lived from 1800 to 1882. 1800 to 1882. And uh, what's interesting, again, this is Dennis Coyle told me this from his uh, research, that he found out about the rapture which we call the rapture theory. That's what most scholars call it, the rapture theory. He found out, it, uh, out about it uh, from two charismatic women uh, during a um, Pentecostal revival service. And these two ladies both claimed that they had a vision from, from Jesus, okay, of, of what was going to happen. And that's when the rapture theory uh, picked up, okay. Uh, with Mr. Uh, Darby. Now, Darby, uh, Brother Scott gave me, uh, I want to say, 10 volumes of his his books. And he says, here, Brother Dan, this is this is where dispensationalism began. Read them and good luck, is what he said. <laughs> okay, whatever the good luck meant, I don't know. But I still have two of those uh, volumes. The other I've, I've given away, but neither of those volumes has anything to do with uh, the rapture. Okay, so as we get going then, without, without a doubt, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, okay, 4, 4, 13 to 18 is one of the most popular end time passages in all of the scripture, okay, and I think that can be agreed on. So the way I look at it is this, we're going to go on an adventure, okay, a scriptural adventure worthy of the inquiring heart and mind, the inquiring heart and mind. Okay, as, as we see this. So uh, I'm going to quote from uh, Mr. Preston. He said this, it will seem non-traditional in that 1 Thessalonians 4 will be shown to speak concerning the coming of Christ in the destruction of Jerusalem at the end of the old covenant world of Israel in A.D. 70. And so what we're going to look at is, is that view and see what we can find here, okay? Uh, if you're interested, I shared this with uh, our dear sister Kendra before we started. If you're really interested in, in the beginnings of the, uh, the rapture theory, 
I just got this in the mail yesterday from CBD, uh, Exporting the Rapture by a fellow named Donald Hartman Atkinson. Uh, it's $33.99 from CBD, okay? So 512 pages concerning that if, if you're interested in that. So let's let the adventure begin and see what we can find here uh, this evening, all right? Now, let's look at some presuppositions. You say, well, what, what's that mean, Brother Dan? Presuppositions that what, what lies behind the traditional interpretation of 1 Thessalonians 4? Okay, the traditional one. Okay, so it is about the rapture, which brings the age of grace to an end so that God may restore his program to Israel. The problem with that is that the scripture never speaks of the end of or the end of the church, the end of time or the end of the church. The scripture never speaks of that. And that's going to be key as we go through the study, right? In fact, this evening, well, here, I'm going to share that with you here in just a, a few few uh, minutes. Uh, let's notice some verses. Let's go, first of all, <clears throat> to Luke chapter number one. Now, I'm going to take my time going through here, and uh, we'll have a good time, I'm sure. But Luke chapter one. All right. Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. Now, the context here is the angel Gabriel coming to Mary, all right, to tell her about giving the birth to the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And uh, Gabriel tells her in verse 32, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end, all right? So there's the angel's, Gabriel's statement to Mary. He's going to give him the throne of David, and of his kingdom there will be no end, all right? We got that? So that brings us over to Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost. Okay, and here the Apostle Peter is, is, is preaching, and beginning in verse 29, and we'll slide all the way down to 36. Peter says, As brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath, to seat one of his descendants on his throne. So one of his descendants, David knew, would sit ultimately on his throne. The angel told Mary what? That this child is going to sit on the throne. Okay. Verse 31. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. So Peter's telling us that David, being a prophet, was looking ahead to the resurrection of the Christ that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Of course, this is the, the apostles that were with him in the group of disciples. Therefore, in 33, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it, was not, for it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says. Who says it? Well, David said it. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that Christ had made him both Lord and and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Okay, so Christ was enthroned and not David, because David knew that one of his descendants would be enthroned, you see. So let's go over to Hebrews chapter 12. 
Okay, Hebrews chapter number 12. Now, I have uh, verse 20, then to see 28, but I think we can read all of them. Beginning in verse 20, chapter 12 of Hebrews. For they could not bear the command, the they here is Israel. If even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. Now, you remember this when Israel is at the foot of Sinai and the Lord said, don't let anybody come up. Okay. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. So even Moses was full of fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Now notice what it says. This is important. The heavenly Jerusalem. The heavenly Jerusalem. And to a myriad of angels. Now just to stop for just a second. What city was Abraham looking for? We all know that, don't we? Chapter 11 of this book, he was looking for the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, so keep that in mind throughout this whole study. Keep it in mind. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those who did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth, much less will they escape who turn away from him who warns them from heaven. And where is he on heaven? In heaven. He's enthroned on, his, on, on the throne, okay? And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of, a created, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. And we, we've talked about this, the, uh, the heaven and earth. You know, we've already done our Bible studies on that. Therefore, here's the verse we're gonna to get to, since we received, notice, since we received a what? A kingdom which cannot be shaken. The kingdom of which our Lord Jesus Christ is the king. Let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. Now that's, that's a tremendous thought. If you follow Luke 1 there to Acts chapter 2, in the Hebrews, we see that, yes, he's, he's, he's going to have a throne, see? And, and, and Peter tells us, yeah, he's, he's there in it, and just as you see here. But, but so that your heart will be calm, uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's do this. Let's come on back uh, to Colossians, please, and chapter 1. Colossians 1. Now, if you're taking notes, write this reference down. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. It was right along with this thought. Okay. Now, in Colossians 1, let's pick it up in verse number 3. <clears throat> we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you. Now notice where in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world. Also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the spirit. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will 
in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. What kind of wisdom and understanding? Spiritual, right? So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience joyously, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. For he, what saints? There are a lot of questions you have to ask yourself here. Because previously, when I read Colossians, I said, body of Christ, that's it, nobody else. But where did the body of Christ begin? A lot of thoughts, okay, things we have to look at. So watch what it says here in verse 13. For he rescued us from the domain, uh, or yeah, the domain of darkness, and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. So right there, Paul says the son, our Lord Jesus Christ, has a kingdom. Is it different than the kingdom that uh, uh, the angel Gabriel told Mary about? Is it different than the kingdom that Peter mentions, all right, in Acts chapter number two, where the Paul writes about in Hebrews chapter number 12, all right? You have to think about these things, okay? That's why I say it's an adventure. It's for those who are willing to open their hearts and their minds and, and search out things. So that brings us where? Now watch. Where is our hope according, uh, according to Paul in Col Colossians chapter number one? It's in heaven, right? Uh, let me ask you this. Where were the rewards of the uh, believing Israelites during the gospel time? Anybody know? <laughs> Here on earth. No, ma'am. It was in heaven. Go, go read Matthew chapter number five. Okay? Chapter five. So when I come over to Colossians chapter three, which you know is my favorite place, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above which Christ, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So Christ is enthroned at the right hand of God. Therefore, what are we to do? Okay, set your minds on things above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Okay, yeah. and, and, and actually verse number four has already been completed for these saints, audience relevance in, in Colossae. Okay, so, it, it, so it's exciting is what I, I'm trying to say to you. Now, one more place, let's go to Ephesians. All right, Ephesians chapter number three. All right. Ephesians chapter number three, and let's look at verses 20 and 21. Now, remember what I, I said about uh, the, the traditional interpretation was that uh, the rapture would come and that would end the church age so that God could continue his program with the nation of Israel, okay? With the nation of Israel. And, and then I said that the problem is that the scripture never speaks of the end of time or the end of the church. Doesn't do that. So when I'm here in uh, Ephesians chapter three, let me turn the page. The last two verses, 20 and 21, it says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations for what? Forever and ever, or the ages to the ages, or the age to the ages. All right, however you want to, uh, want to see that, whichever Bible you're using. So there's no end to it, okay, to the church. Now, in, in a, a, a different study, uh, I would challenge you to do this yourself. Read Ephesians very carefully, especially chapter 2. Because the Gentile believers were added to somebody to make one body, one new man. Okay? Read that and see what you come up with, and it'll be a blessing to you. Now, so... <laughs> Literally there in chapter 3 here of Ephesians 20, 21, it's age of the ages. 
So does the church age have an end? I think this is an overlooked uh, principle in the scripture that people just pass over. All right, pass over. Uh, now, the reason I say this, is if you come back to Matthew with me, 24, please. Matthew 24. Let's notice the first three verses, and we've read these about 20 times each in our Matthew studies. Matthew 24 and 25. That, that. But watch what this says. Verses 1 to 3. Jesus came out from the temple and was going away. When his disciples came up to point out the temple building to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. So he's predicting the destruction of the temple. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, so this is a short time later, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? The sign of your coming and the end of the age. Well, what age? Well, that's something for you to think about, isn't it? Okay. What age are we talking about there? Uh, uh, what age did the temple represent? The old covenant. Or the old covenant. Okay. That. Thank you, Kendra. Okay. The old covenant age of, you know, I, I wrote down here, does it, does it represent the old covenant age of Israel or the new covenant age of the Messiah? Of course, Kendra just answered that. The temple represents the old covenant age of, okay, Israel. Uh, and, and, and that we, what we see. So the disciples connected then the old covenant with Moses. And the law, you, you, you read that later. So, but we know it can't be the new covenant that they're looking at the end for because the new covenant had not yet been revealed. And we know that the new, the new covenant has no relationship with the temple that was standing. So are you sure about that, Dan? Yes. Come to John with me in chapter four. John chapter four, please. All right. John chapter number four. All right. I'll pick it up in verse number 20. John four, verse 20. Remember the dear woman at the well? Who was the first person that recognized that Jesus or that Jesus told that he was the Messiah? It was her. Right. I am he, you know, when she was talking to him, which, which I find interesting because when, when you're in Matthew 16 and the apostles say, thou art the Christ, this, you know, uh, the Messiah. And he says, don't tell anybody. But here he reveals it to this dear lady. Now, when we read this, verses 20 through 24, it says, our fathers, this is her speaking, worshiped in this mountain and you people. Okay, people's in parentheses here in the New American Standard say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is of the Jews. True statement. But an hour is coming. Now, now notice what he says. And now is. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. In other words, the temple will no longer have a, a place, okay, in the, in the worship of God. But not at all, all right? So to me, that, that, that's very, very eye-opening, okay, very eye-opening. So there, there is something critical to understand then, three, three points here. Number one is this. Okay, the Jews only believed in two ages. Dan, are you sure? Well, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Preston wrote that, and I had to go look it up. And I have uh, uh, five volumes of books uh, of uh, what the Jews believed, okay, during the time Jesus was on, was on earth. 
So it follows their their thinking on the law and the covenant and that. And it's brought clearly out in those books that only two ages, say, the age of the old, the old covenant age and then the new messianic age okay, that hasn't been revealed yet. OK, so uh, so the Jews only believed in two ages, Jesus and the New Testament writers concurred in this belief and doctrine. This age and the age to come, you know, as Paul shows us. Number two, the Jewish, this age was the age of Moses, the law, and the age to come was the age of the Messiah, all right, the Messiah and the new covenant. And we've talked about that many, many times, uh, the allegory that Paul gives us in Galatians, where they're, they're passing one another, okay, just like the sons of Isaac did. The number three is this, the age of Moses and the law was to end while the age of the Messiah and the new covenant was to be eternal. Uh, come back to Matthew 24 one more time. And watch what we have here. Verse 35. Heaven and earth will pass away. And what was he talking about there, heaven and earth? Does anybody remember? <laughs> okay that has to do with the temple right and 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 the old covenant as, as we studied before but he says but my words will not pass away so the lord's words will be we'd say eternal all right and where do you get those words from anyway in our studies of john there with the son he got them from the father okay they're not going to pass away but the heaven and earth will but not the physical heaven and earth so it's all it's, it's a spiritual side of this okay so that's important to, as as we look at that so it's important then in our studies let me read this to you first thessalonians 4 all futuristic views of first thessalonians 4 place it at the end of the christian age yet as we have seen just briefly the christian age has no end thus we say again the basic presupposition that underlies the majority view of thessalonians is fundamentally flawed they think a rapture is coming to end the age of the church okay if the christian age has no end then no matter what you think thessalonians means it does not apply to a future end of the Christian age. And that's an important thing to look at. Okay. Now, I know, remember, this is an introduction. We're trying to <laughs> get you, get you thinking here. All right. Uh, uh, in addition, there, there's four facts here, and these are really going to cement us in what's going on. There's four facts that are critical to the understanding and interpreting of first Thess Thessalonians chapter number four, four of them. Now, I'm going to try to do one fact per week if I can, all right? And in fact, if we have enough time, I can get started on, on one of them. But the first fact is this, and I'm going to be honest with you. This took me hours to digest and, and, and talking to people, different people about this, okay? But 1 Thessalonians 4, as the restoration of the lo life lost in Adam. Adam was in the garden with God, was he not? Yes, he was. And a number of weeks ago, I did a little blurb on, on this. Uh, in the day that ye eat thereof, you shall surely what? You shall surely die. Dying, you shall die. Then, then the devil says, or the serpent says, you shall not surely die. Did Adam die? Not physically. <laughs> he didn't die physically, did he? So evidently that death that God was speaking about was not a physical death at all. And, <laughs> and this, this is a, you know, a study uh, that, that we'll take our time with. Okay, and, and look at because it's, it's very important to understand that 
Adam lived another 930 years or so. Okay. So, uh, so what we're going to look at then is, is the death of Adam in the life of Christ and what it really means in terms of first Thessalonians chapter number four. And, and I know our, our Miss Gail, who's with us tonight has a, you know, oh, brother Dan, who, who went up and who, you know, all that kind of stuff. Well, we're going to find out uh, when we uh, uh, study that, that part of the, uh, uh, that's fact one is what it is. Fact two is this, First uh, Thessalonians 4, as the hope of Israel. In fact, the whole book as the hope of Israel. Fact number three, First Thessalonians as the arrival of the new tabernacle. Wait a minute, brother Dan, you said there was a, uh, the temple wasn't going to be around. Okay, and all that. Well, let me ask you, what are you tonight as you're sitting watching this? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. What's the scripture say? You are we're the church. By the Holy Spirit. We're the temples of God. Yeah. We are the temple of God. No building made, made without hands. And, and you'll see this. It'll be, it'll be fun. Okay, part of our adventure. And then fact number four is this. Uh, and you all like weddings, don't you? So uh, First Thessalonians 4 as a time of the remarriage of Israel to God. Did God divorce Israel back in the prophets? Yes, he did, if you don't know that. Okay, yeah. you can go look that up in your concordance. Okay, but... We're also going to see that he's going to remarry them, okay, which, which is exciting. Now, I got 20 to 8. I don't know how much time you folks have. Okay. Which one? Go to 8 o'clock? Well, they haven't. <clears throat> that's the plan. Okay, that's the plan. All right, so let's look at hope number two then. Uh, at least I'll begin hope number two. And uh, that's this, that, that Thessalonians as the hope of Israel. Okay, Thessalonians as the hope of Israel. Now, here's a statement. Hang on to it. All New Testament prophecy is the reiteration of Old Testament promises made to Israel. All New Testament prophecy comes from the Old Testament. Okay? Comes from the Old Testament. Uh, and, and this will be established, if, if you please, from key texts found in the writings of Peter, John, and Paul, okay? Now, someone called them the big three in, in Scripture, but the big one is our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And what you're going to find, uh, I hope you have, if you have a good reference Bible, okay, uh, that gives you references in, in the columns and, and that sort of thing, uh, it's, it's going to take you from, statements they make back to the Old Testament, if that's where it originated, okay? So let's look at just a couple places where our Lord Jesus Christ, where you can see the source of his eschatology, of his prophecy, last day's prophecy, was wrapped up in the uh, Old Testament. So let's come to Matthew 5. Well, let's start there. Matthew 5, just, just to start there. And... Uh, We've seen these verses now in our studies. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. The law or the prophets. Remember? I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until what is accomplished. All is accomplished. Okay, until all is accomplished. Now, the Torah, in the mind of the Jews, the first five books, okay, was prophecy. And I think we, you and I need to understand that as, as uh, Gentiles, okay? And prophecy then was the Torah. That's how they saw it. The law was the Torah, or, and, and prophecy, and prophecy was the Torah. Uh, let me share, see if I can share this with you. First Corinthians, please, in chapter 14. First Corinthians 14. All right. First Corinthians 14. 
Let's notice verses 20 and 21. 14, yes, 20 and 21. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet, e uh, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to the people, and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then tongues are for a sign, he goes into that. But here, hear what you see. By men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me. Now that's a quote from, I'm looking at B here, verse 21, Isaiah 28, 11. So Isaiah 28, 11, look forward to that with these, these people that lips are strange and, and that sort of thing, okay? So you, you get that idea right there. And then in, in Matthew, let's come back to Matthew 11, please. Matthew 11. You know, I hate to overburden you with scripture, but that's how we, scripture with scripture, right? Uh, chapter 11, please, and notice verse number 13. This is our Lord speaking. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you were, are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah, who was to come. So here, what is the Lord doing? He's connecting John's ministry with an Old Testament prophet. And the things that John taught from, okay, the Old Testament and that sort of thing. Then, and then with, with one more thing with Paul, which I thought was good, is Acts chapter 24, okay, Acts chapter 24, and notice please verses 14 and 15, okay, uh, as we're looking here, but this I admit to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers. Believing, notice what Paul says here, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection both of the righteous and of the wicked. So again, Paul is doing what? He's going back to the law and what's written in the prophets. So Let's look at just a couple of verses about Jesus, uh, his mission included uh, end time prophecy, promises made to Israel. So to do that, we'll go back to John, John chapter 11, okay, John chapter 11. Now I'm going to, John 11 verse 50 and 51, please. I'll tell you what, let's read 49, okay, John 11, uh, 49. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people, that the whole nation not perish. Now he did not say this on his own initiative. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for a nation. Well, where would Caiaphas get his information that one man must die for the people? We're back to the Old Testament, Isaiah 55 or 52, 53, and in other places, okay, uh, as you see this. So uh, we look at that and go back to Matthew 15 one more time. Matthew 15, please. And uh, let's see. Be with you in just a second. Matthew 15 and verses 21 to 28. 21 to 28. Now, th this is interesting here. Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. 
But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps shouting at us. But he answered and said, I, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, O oh, woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Okay. Her daughter was he healed at once. And, and so as you look at this passage, you see when the Messiah, the, and I can't give you all of these, but the Messiah uh, was predicted to come to save whom? Israel. All right. And, and that's the teaching that you see in the Old Testament. And then later on in the Old Testament, they, they gather in the idea of other nations. And, and we'd call them the, uh, the Gentiles, okay? The, the Gentiles, as, as we see this. Um, if you want to write down Isaiah 49 and verse number 6, actually 5 and 6, talks about an acceptable time at the second coming. Uh, here's, here's a good one. Um, come back to Hosea with me right after Daniel. Okay. Let's come back to Hosea. Uh, does anybody remember God telling Hosea to go take a woman, uh, to marry? And what kind of woman was she? Does anybody remember from the scriptures? was a prostitute okay a woman of ill repute right mm -hmm. and and so hosea does as he's commanded he has a number of children that's where you get the name low of me and, and different names like that uh, you see it right in chapter one but if you'll read chapters one uh through three and then chapter 13 very carefully okay uh oh that's peter i'm sorry forgive me just one through three uh you're going to find some very interesting things. Come to chapter 2 with me. And let me read you a couple verses here. Beginning in uh, verse 14. Now, my Bible has the heading here, Restoration of Israel. In verse 14 it says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her, bring her into the wilderness, and speak kindly to her. Then I will give her her vineyards from there, in the valley of Achor as a door of hope. And she will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. So we're talking about Israel, right? It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me Ishai, uh, Ishai, which means my husband, and will no longer call me Baali. Baali means my master or my Baal, okay? For I will remove the name of the Baals from her mouth, so that they will be mentioned by their names no more. And that day I also will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, the creeping things of the ground, and I will abolish the bow and the sword and the war from the land, and I will make them lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness, and in compassion, and I will betroth you to me. Now notice, me, hopefully in your Bibles, capitalized. In faithfulness, then you will know the Lord, okay? Then you will know the Lord. So it just gives you an idea. And if you read right down through chapter number three, and chapter three only has uh, five verses, okay? You, you get, the, get the idea that God's going to remarry Israel, okay? Going to remarry Israel. And uh, uh, so, so that's a wonderment to me. Because when you read all the gospel accounts, especially John, as we saw in our last study of John, uh, there's a lot of eschatology in these gospel accounts that Jesus brings forth. But you look at them in, in terms of your reference Bibles, and they're going to take you back to the Old Testament. Okay, back to the Old Testament. So our Lord's eschatology then, last days prophecy, revolved around the hope of of Israel. Okay. It revolved around the hope of Israel. And what we want to show you is that's what 
Thessalonians revolves around, hope of Israel. Uh, when we come to Peter's eschatology, uh, let's come back to chapter 3 of Acts, please. See, I'm beginning to hurry because I... Acts chapter 3. All right, let's notice verses 21 here, please, to 24, Acts 3. Uh, says, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. Moses said, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me, from your brethren, to him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announce these days. So what is Peter doing here? He's using Old Testament prophecy okay, to bring, to bring in what he believes. If we go back to 1 Peter... All right, First Peter, please. All right, First Peter chapter 1. Notice verses 9 through 12. Chapter 1, 9 through 12, okay? Here it says, Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. In these things which now have been announced to you, through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look for. So what is what is Peter telling us? That this grace of God was prophesied. Now this is coming, all right? And and it was the prophets who, who uh, did that, okay? So that, that's kind of interesting. Uh, come over to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter number 3, please. Here we go. First three verses. <clears throat> oh, by the way, let me just say this before I go on. In First Peter that we just read, 9 to 12, he's talking about the salvation being the end of their faith at a given time frame, the second coming, okay? Because, you know, I've always taught the, the difference between them and uh, people today in the age of grace is that when we believe we get our salvation. Well, they did too. They're looking for a deliverance from the whole business, see. Okay, so chapter 3 here in Second Peter, notice verses 1 to 3. This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you, in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder, that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust. Now, that's just an example of the what the prophets, okay, spoke about as you look at that. And again, you can you can go look look those verses up. Come come down to verse 13, where it says, but according to his promise, we are looking for a new heavens and new earth in which dwelleth righteousness right out of Isaiah chapter 65 and 66. If you really want to have a good time with Peter, read Peter. Read, I have it marked here, uh, Isaiah 50 and Isaiah 65 and 66. Okay, and, and you'll see where Peter's whole theology on eschatology comes from, right from Isaiah, okay, from Isaiah. Uh, well, we got a few more minutes. Uh, let's look at John here. Of course, John's going to give us the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He recorded those for us. So let's go to John chapter 4, please. John chapter 4. 
All right. And let's begin in verse 21. John, that's three, Dan. Let's go to four. Here we are. John four. Uh, boo, 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 boo. Oh, we already read this, so I don't have to read it again. Okay. Uh, this has to do with the woman at the well and, and worshiping God and, and where that idea comes from. Okay. Uh, that, that sort of thing. So uh, ba -bum. anything in there I need to No, there isn't. Okay. So, so that's good. Let's come right to chapter five as long as we're there, chapter 5, and let's know 24 through 28. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eonian life or eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will do what? They will live. This is Old Testament teaching on resurrection, but not just that. Has passed out of death into life. When we look at fact number one with, with Adam, we'll uh, look at that. Now you can you can uh, mark along with 24 through actually 28 here if, if you want to. Um, verses 24 to 28. Mark these verses, Ezekiel 37 and Daniel chapter number 12, okay? For there you see the promise of Israel's resurrection in the last days, at the end of the age in the establishment of the kingdom, okay? Establishment of a kingdom. Uh, John also wrote, the course, the book of Revelation, which is full of all sorts of things about the end times, isn't it? And, of course, Revelation is based on Daniel's. Uh, for the most part, Daniel, uh, Zechariah, and Ezekiel, some of Isaiah, and, and other prophets. So the point I'm trying to make is that his eschatological hope was the hope of Israel that we find from the Old Testament. Now, Paul, and I'll go over time, but let's let's look at Paul's uh, source of eschatology here, okay? So let's go to Acts chapter 24, and they're all in Acts except uh, one verse. Or one set of verses. Acts chapter 24, please. <clears throat> Acts 24, let's uh, read 1 through 5. After five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders, with an attorney named Tertullius, and they brought charges to the governor against Paul. After Paul had been summoned, Tertullius began to accuse him, saying to the governor, since we have uh, thought you attained much peace, or through you attained much peace, and since by your providence reforms are being carried out for this nation. So we acknowledge that this is in every way and everywhere, most excellent Felix, with all thanksgiving. But that I may not weary you any further, I beg you to grant us by your kindness a brief hearing. For we have found this man a real pest and a fellow who stirs up dissension among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Okay, of course, that's Jesus, right? He even tried to desecrate the temple and then we arrested him. We wanted to judge him according to our own law. Okay, but as you read down through here, what did Paul say to those folks? Okay, he says, I didn't desecrate anything. There's no way you can prove what I did. Everything I did was according to the law. All right. Remember, James asked him to go in and uh, with with these uh, uh, Jews that wanted to take a vow. And so we see that with Paul. He was willing to do that. Okay, back to the Old Testament into the new. So when I come over to chapter 26, please notice verse number five. Since they have known about me for a long time, if they are willing to testify that I live as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And what did the Pharisees live by? Law. The law, right? In fact, they added to the law. See? <laughs> then we go uh, 26, 21. 
Ah, he's, he's still talking about, for this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. And for what purpose? I mean, Paul was, Paul was following what James wanted him to do according to the law, take a vow and all that sort of thing. So what I'm showing you is that what Paul still was connected to that Old Testament and, and looking towards this. So when I come to chapter 28, okay, and uh, bum, bum, bum. notice verse 19, but when the Jews <clears throat> objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of of whom? Israel. The hope of Israel. Okay? The hope of Israel. Tell you what, come on back to chapter 26 one more time. 26, 21. Okay? And, uh, bum, bum, bum. oh, here it is. Yeah. 21. For this reason, some Jews seized me in the temple and tried to put me to death. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both the small and great, stating, now watch what he says, nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place. So here with, with, with in the life of Paul even, and I don't have time to go through it all here, but uh, this, this idea that, that uh, uh, actually what do we want to call it here okay make sure we, we do it correctly here uh <clears throat> this idea that thessalonians actually is talking about the hope of israel and we'll see that as as we go on in more detail as we look at the other three uh, uh facts um especially the one about adam and his death okay because that's going to directly relate to what we read about the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which remain, okay? And we have to get settled on that, remember? Uh, and, and, and that sort of thing so that we can uh, come to a conclusion, okay? Come to a conclusion. So I, I'll tell you what, uh, I'm gonna stop there and, and pick this up next Wednesday, okay? And uh, uh, we'll have a good time with it. So any anybody wanna say anything or? make a statement or anything questions <laughs> you know uh that, that we might have just hang in there listen remember what i said it's going to be an adventure and preconceived ideas now i'm not telling you to get rid of them what i'm saying okay is put them in a box for a while do that we had to do that with the universal reconciliation business you see Okay, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, things prior to that, the hell thing is what we had to put in the box till we saw everything about the um, universal reconciliation. So keep that in mind, and you'll have a good time with it. Uh, these verses I gave you, and even as you read through your New Testament, where there seems to be eschatological and other last day prophecies, look in your, look and see if you have a reference there in your reference Bible, and go read the Old Testament. And, and what you're going to find is going to flow right through and you'll have a good time with it. Okay. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to say good night. I want to thank you all for being here. Uh,